For 10,000 years did the bright empire Melnibune flourish, ruling the world. 10,000 years before history was recorded, or 10,000 years after history had ceased to be chronicled. For that span of time, reckon it how you will, the bright empire had thrived. Be hopeful, if you like, and think of the dreadful past the earth has known, or brood upon the future. But if you would believe the unholy truth, then time is an agony of now, and so it always will be. Ravaged at last by the formless terror called time, Melnibane fell, and newer nations succeeded her. Ilmayora, Shigoth, Medak, Salim. Then history began. India, China, Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Greece and Rome. All these came after Melnibane, but none lasted 10,000 years. And none dealt in the terrible mysteries, the secret sorceries of old Melnibane. None used such power or knew how. Only Melnibone ruled the earth for a hundred centuries, and then, even she, shaken by the casting of frightful runes, attacked by powers greater than men, powers who decided that Melnibone's span of ruling had been over long. Then she crumbled, and their sons were scattered. They became wanderers across an earth which hated and feared them, siring few offspring, slowly dying, slowly forgetting the secrets of their mighty ancestors. Such a one was the cynical, laughing Elric, a man of bitter brooding and gusty humour, proud prince of ruins, lord of a lost and humbled people, last son of Melnibane's sundered line of kings. Elric, the moody-eyed wanderer, a lonely man who fought a world living by his wits and his rune-sword Stormbringer. Elric, last lord of Melnibane, last worshipper of its grotesque and beautiful gods, reckless reaver, cynical slayer, torn by great griefs and with a knowledge locked in his skull which would turn lesser men into babbling idiots. Elric, moulder of madness, dabbler in wild delights. to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. In this, the first full-blooded podcast, we look at the first of the big five Moorcock characters, Elric, the doomed emperor of the ancient civilization of Melnibone. I mentioned in our introductory episode the impact of my grandfather's hand-me-downs on my impressionable 10 or 11 year old brain, and the first Michael Moorcock paperbacks to hit my eyes were the 1971 S science fiction special edition of The Warlord of the Air. And, more pertinently today's podcast, the 1967 US Lancer edition of Stormbringer, which was my introduction to the character of Elric. The first page carried a quote from one J.G. Ballard, who said, A work of powerful and sustained imagination, which confirms Michael Moorcock's position as the most important successor to Mervyn Peake and Wyndham Lewis. These strange and tormented landscapes, peopled by characters of archetypal dimensions, are the settings for a series of titanic duels between the forces of chaos and order. Nightmare armies clash on the shores of spectral seas. Phantom horsemen ride in on skeleton steeds across a world as fantastic as those of Bosch and Bruegel. Over these presides the central figure of Elric, the haunted warrior king whose ambivalent relationship with magical sword Stormbringer is the author's most original creation. The vast, tragic and sometimes terrifying symbols by which Mr Moorcock continually illuminates the metaphorical quest of his hero are a measure of the author's remarkable talents. Now, young teenage me had no idea who J.G. Ballard was, or Mervyn Peake, or Wyndham Lewis for that matter, but Nightmare Armies, great, sign me up. Phantom Horsemen and Magical Swords, they were right up my alley. The one reference I did understand, strangely, was Bruegel, having spent hours and hours poring over the tiny, lurid, an unsettlingly detailed imagery of his painting The Triumph of Death, which had been used on the cover of Black Sabbath's greatest hits. 
Regarding those paperbacks, I still have them the thick end of 40 years later, and I'll pop pictures on the, uh, on the site page. Although not Moorcock's first fantasy invention, Alric is probably his most enduring, although we may have to revisit that statement when we start to look at Jerry Cornelius later. Elric crossed over into pop culture in a big way in the 1970s, appearing first in comics, including numerous appearances in Marvel comics, both as a guest character in The Savage Sword of Conan and being the subject of adaptations by industry giants like Roy Thomas and P. Craig Russell. It wasn't long before progressive rock and heavy metal began to draw on Elric for inspiration, with bands like Hawkwind and Blue Oyster Cult writing songs about the moody albino and his doomed world, and even collaborating directly with Mocock on compositions, culminating with the author joining Hawkwind on stage as narrator during their live performance of the entirely Elric-focused epic album, The Chronicle of the Black Sword. The new wave of British heavy metal was also smitten with Mocock, with Elric appearing not only in the music, but also on the cover, courtesy of prolific fantasy artist and album sleeve regular, Rodney Matthews. Many more metal bands have continued this trend since, and we'll look at a few of those in a few future episode. There have also been numerous tabletop role-playing games based upon Elric and other characters from Mocock's oeuvre, starting with Chaosium's Stormbringer in 1981. We'll also take a broad look at these in a later episode, but in the meantime, I can heartily recommend listening to the Stormbringer episodes of The Grognard Files, and I'll pop a link to that on the Breakfast in the Ruins website. Sadly, we still haven't seen an Elric film, despite repeated efforts to bring him to the big screen, but that seems to be a theme for Moorcock. Only one of his books and characters has been translated to the screen, but we'll talk about that in a couple of episodes' time, as well as news of an impending television adaptation of another of Moorcock's Big Five. So today, we'll be looking at the first published Elric story, The Dreaming City. Written when Moorcock was a tender 21, it found first print in issue 47 of Science Fantasy magazine in 1961. Over subsequent decades, it would be reprinted in a variety of collections, along with a few other early short story outings, beginning with The Stealer of Souls in 1963. Later, The Dreaming City was rearranged along with some, but not all, stories from The Stealer of Souls into a collection called The Weird of the White Wolf. This followed efforts to arrange the Elric stories in chronological order, following a big expansion of the Elric character and lore in the form of some novellas in the mid-60s, including the stories that comprised the novel Stormbringer, and a full prequel novel in 1972, Elric of Melnibonir. I won't go into any detail regarding the publication history of these tales, as that way madness lies, particularly without charts and a good whiteboard. I would, however, recommend Elric, a reader's guide, most recently published in the Gorank Stormbringer collection, that also includes a draft script for an aborted Elric movie from the 1970s, well worth checking out. There would be many more Elric novels and shorts, as Moorcock could never resist returning to his creation, often dabbling and revisiting and revising the mythos of Elric, continuing right through to the 2000s and culminating with White Wolf's Son in 2005. Joining me to take a first dive in the Young Kingdoms is Loz, an old friend and fellow traveller of the Moonbeam Roads. So lay back on your velvet cushions and join us as we embark upon a very spoilery discussion around the Dreaming City. Right, hello everybody, we're in Derry and Tom's roof garden, and I'm here with Loz, my friend of 29 odd years. 29 long years. Yeah, probably. 29 long, yeah, tough, yeah, hard yeah, years. Yeah. Um, Loz is here to talk about Elric, and actually specifically the first Elric story, published in 1961, The Dreaming City. But before we get into that, Loz, tell me about your background with fantasy, and particularly uh, Michael Moorcock. Um, fantasy probably always starts with Tolkien and mm. uh, read a lot of the rings um, after I finished that I was kind of scrabbling around in the library in the olden days when you had to go to a library and say <laughs> hi can I borrow this book for two weeks and if you didn't they'd bring it back they'd charge you 20p mm. which in those days was the price of a car probably mm. possibly or an airship um, so scrabbling around read some absolute dross probably by uh Terry Brooks. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, I, ne- yeah. I never really went down the Terry Brooks rabbit hole. Yeah, I went went down one of the rabbit holes mm. and then decided it was absolute crap, so I moved on. Is that the Sword of Shannara? 
Yeah, or the hat of Shannara, mm. or the you know suspicious jug of Shannara. <laughs> I can't remember how it went on, but um, so and I found that I read a review in White Dwarf, mm. the role play magazine for mm-hmm. people who don't know what I'm talking about, mm. uh, and it reviewed um, one of the Corrin books, mm. and it, I just remember it. The, just the way it was described, I thought oh, I'll give that a bash. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, I saw a advert for Stormbringer, the role playing game, mm-hmm. and it was on about Elric and dragons and stuff. Mm-hmm. I thought that sounds quite interesting, mm-hmm. but they didn't have Elric, so I just went straight for this Corrin book, Knight of the Swords, and it had a really rubbish cover of uh, it's more or less a rubbish stick man with a sword <laughs> <laughs> in uh, with black one, he had a red cloak on, so yeah. that was supposed to be Corrin, but yeah. it was just like a stick man. Mm. Uh, and red Knight of the Swords, and went, Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm having a bit of that, it's completely different. Didn't have any dwarfs, elves, hobbits, or mm-hmm. all that crap in it, and half the stuff you can pronounce, but um, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was cool. And then you found found out it was all linked together with Elric and Hawkmoon and all the others, and they always was mentioned in each book, so you went, oh, that sounds brilliant. Mm. I wonder what Elric's all about. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so went on to Elric. Obviously, I think we just discussed briefly earlier about the order of the Elric books were a bit confusing. Oh, yes, very much so. So I probably read them all completely randomly without yeah. knowing what the hell went on. Sailor yeah. of the Seas of Fate, probably the first book I read. Yeah, uh, it, it was a really, really tough decision thinking about this. And I know we had a couple of conversations about um, what to do. And you wanted to do Knight of Swords. Um, yeah. But I, I think because the first mock-up book I ever read was an Elric book, and actually it was Stormbringer, it wasn't this at all. But yeah. I went back to thinking about it, and I picked this up, and The Dreaming City is the first published Elric story from 1961 I thought well why not start there because if you go chronologically um, the first Elric story is Elric of Melnibonair well let's get into pronunciations now shall we Uh, apparently Melnibonair is the correct way of pronouncing it it's Melnibonair it's Melnibonair Melnibonair this is going to get messy over the course of this um, we're from Yorkshire so you know we we only speak barely English and then we've got uh, (laughs) other, other languages it's got a Thing on a hyphen on the end, or whatever yes. it's called. Yeah. So it's Melnibone. Melnibone, Melnibone. Well, but let's, rem- let's see how, how many times we pronounce it differently. Over, yeah, over I the, think it's probably. Over yeah. The course of this. yeah. Um, so yeah, it just it just seemed like a good starting point. And if if you start with chronologically the first one, Elric of Melnibone, 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 whatever, Elric, whatever. Yeah, yeah Elric. Um, yeah. It was written in 1972, 11 years later, and there were a shit ton of stories between <laughs> them, them and there. So so it's a prequel, really, to all intents and purposes. But also, I think the um, there's something about the El- the the very early Moorcock stuff which is really interesting because he's like 22 years old. He's been the editor of what is it? I don't know, Tarzan or Sexton Blake Library or or whatever it is, and he's yeah. already editing um, magazines. So he's, he's kind of they're just 16 or something, wasn't it? How, yeah. How do you manage that? How do yeah. you blag that one? When I, have I, no when idea. I was 16, oh Christ, I couldn't. Yeah, doing homework was quite <laughs> difficult. <laughs> yeah. So this is how we settled on the on the Dreaming City. Now, of course, just to confuse matters, there was an unauthorised version of Elric of Melnibone, stroke Melnibone, um, released in America called The Dreaming City. So just for clarity, we're doing the 1961 novella. What is a novella? I don't really know. Apparently there's some kind of quantifiable... Interestingly enough, I could probably... Uh help you out on that but uh-huh. the number has escaped me how right. long it has to be in that case don't bother <laughs> no I'm not going to but there's also n- fake news yeah exactly a novelette as well yeah, oh. but, yeah. well let's not go there it's no. about 40 page short story yeah I think it's, yeah, <laughs> I think it's a short story in my... let's stick with that I was surprised how, how short it was actually because in my head it was always as you said a novella or a yeah. short book or whatever well, I think the really great thing about the Marcotte books of this of this vintage is even the full book's only about 130 pages you can read yeah. it on three trips to the throne in general so yeah. you know I think that that definitely appealed to me when I was 18 because you know you mentioned that you find out that there's all these other books out there and all these other heroes and characters that he's written um, and he was knocking them out at a phenomenal rate at yeah, one yeah. point and I think he I think at one point he knocked one out one of the Hartman books in three days I think he wrote all four in three days, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and you could probably tell towards the latter two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I look forward to doing Sword of the Dawn. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that, that will be a hoot. Um, but yeah, it was knocking about at a phenomenal rate. But in many ways, I, I suppose, Mocock books were 
our Pokemon. Um, once Ooh. we realised they existed, it was like there was a list. I mean, I'm looking at the list at the beginning of this Panther, Panther book from 1984, um, and it's substantial. So Yeah, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. I think sometimes you after you've read a few and you get really into it, so you're looking at this list and you're going, God, I bet the ice schooner's great. And then, <laughs> and then you read it and it's not so much. Yeah, I really look forward to reading the Blood Red game. Yeah, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah snake oh, eyes. Yeah. But yeah, straight away, six Coram books, uh, four hot, well, seven Hawkmoon books, anyway, etc. So, anyway, we picked this one. So, it's either that or the Golden Barge. <laughs> Have you yeah. read that? Heavens help me. I've got a really nice paperback edition of it, but I, I, I think we'd have to I wouldn't go ever down care that, to bother reading it again. We'd have to go down that route. Well, now now we've started this, we're going to have to delve into all sorts of <laughs> unpleasantness. Dubious unpleasantness. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah. Let's let's kick off with a dreaming city. So it kicks off. Bunch of six blokes huddled around a fire, anxiously awaiting the arrival of the mysterious seventh bloke. Yep. Um, it's after midnight. We learn that this seventh bloke, Elric, intends to take back the ruby throne from his usurper cousin, Yerkun. Yeah, Yerkun uh, is Yerkun. probably how I would pronounce yeah, yeah, it. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the six men are Dermot of Jarkor, who's lean faced. He is lean faced. <laughs> Very easy. Ferdan of Lormir, who's podgy lipped. Yeah, po- podgy of lip. Yeah, we, we get an instant <laughs> feel for characterisation from this. But in a way, I really, really like it, because his language is really, really spare, but straight away, yeah. we're figuring out who's who. We've got Jiku the Dandy, yeah, who's I... long-nosed and impolite. Yeah. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's always scratching his long nose as yeah, well, yeah. I noticed. Yeah. Um, we've got King Naclon, Naclon Naclon of, of Vilmia, who's cautious and pragmatic. Yeah. And then probably the two who will get most to do the Yaris, young heir to a recently deceased sea king, who is a bit impetulant, a bit impulsive. Impetulant? That's not even a word. A bit impu- It could be. Yeah, well, let's say it is. He's a bit impulsive, petulant, distrust, distrust Elric immensely, yeah. and is a bit... He bit, seems a bit of a teenage nobody who's yeah. just discovered he's got a country. It he? Basically, yeah. that's exactly that's, what it is. That's, 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 that sums him up. Yeah. And, uh, He's getting up the nose of all the rest of them as a result. I think the oldest Especially thing is, Jackie with the dandy. Especially <laughs> Jackie with the dandy. And, Massively uh, up his I think, I think Damn it of Jacko thinks he's an absolute tool. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, we've got Count Smeorgan Baldhead. Yeah. Now, <laughs> it is amazing to think, really, you know, we, we, we end up getting the Stormbringer role playing game many years later and you get these character stat blocks. People who don't play role playing games, but I have a fucking clue what we're talking about. But you get character stat blocks for. Dive into VAR and count my organ bald head. And you yeah. think, after reading this back, I do think, well, he was quite lucky. <laughs> quite lucky to get that much. He probably gets more more word count in the role playing game than he does yeah, actually but, but in I, the story. I always imagine he was in more than one story, though. Yeah, because he, he was obviously a Leviathan of literature <laughs> <laughs> character, but. It'll be yeah. interesting to find out as we go through them, but yeah. um, you know. I'm sure that would because I was really surprised that was his piece. Yeah, well, yeah. suffice to say, he's in this. Yeah, and he's got a bald. He's head. very much in it, or yeah. a bald pate. Yes, that's right. Not to be confused. So, Count Smeagan bald head isn't Smeagan of bald head. <laughs> no, no, that would, that he's would literally be cool. got a bald head. Yeah. Uh, now, Smeagan actually yeah. trusts Elric. They seem to have some pre-existing relationship. He urges patience. Yeah, which, generally is, has. which is never mentioned. No. Why he generally has Elric's back. Yeah. And these we find are the six most preeminent sea lords in this world, and they're gathered together to plot the sack of the dreaming city of the title Indeed. Imria with Elric's support. So Imria, we learn, is the capital of the once mighty Melnibonean, Melnibonean, Melnibonean <laughs> Empire. The Bright this Empire. Is gonna, the Bright Empire. This well, is going to be a struggle. Um, especially if we do a dozen of these podcasts about Elric. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just call it the Scottish Island yeah, or something. Yeah, that's right. We'll have, we'll have to come to some form of agreement. So they all have a good back and forth, and Yaris is, is giving it quite large, but damn it's having none of it. And uh, so I'm about to read paragraph two from page 31, a little bit of exposition. Fool! Damn it's voice rumbled across the fire-flooded hall. He laughed wearily. I spoke thus in my youth, and lost a fine fleet soon after. Cunning and Elric's knowledge will win us in rear. That and the mightiest fleet to sail the sighing sea since Melnibonet's banners fluttered over all the nations of the earth. Here we are, the most powerful sea lords in the world. Masters, every one of us, of more than a hundred swift vessels. Our names are feared and famous. Our fleets ravage the coast of a score of lesser nations. We hold power. He clenched his great fist and shook it in Yaris's face. 
his tone became more level and he smiled viciously, glaring at the youth and choosing his words with precision. But all this is worthless, meaningless without the power which Elric has. That is the power of knowledge, of sorcery, if I must use the cursed word. His fathers knew of the maze which guards Imria from sea attack, and his fathers passed that secret on to him. Imria, the dreaming city, dreams in peace, and will continue to do so unless we have a guide that help us steer a course through the treacherous waterways which lead to our harbours. We need Elric. We know it, and he knows it. That's the truth. So we get our first little bit of exposition about why they want Elric involved. But we still don't really know anything about Elric. And I think I think um, Darmit's kind of crowbarred the Dreaming City into mm. his uh, <laughs> into his piece yeah. there, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's it's a pretty good setup. We're yeah. only we're only really two pages in, and we've already got our setup. It's effectively a four hundred ship heist yeah. of uh, a city of riches that's guarded by a ridiculous maze that only Elric can guide them through. Yeah. Um, of course, Elric turns up, bang on cue. Now, I think this is probably a good point just to kind of discuss Elric in pop culture before we read the description of him. Because, of course, if you think about Elric now, and you've got all these, uh, you know, the old Panther paperback covers, you've got um, numerous paintings where he's generally, he either looks slightly effeminate or he just looks like basically a red eyed white elf. Yeah. He's generally always wearing spiky black armour. Or a loincloth. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, the cover yeah, of the Weird yeah. of the White Wolf that I've got at the moment is wearing what looks like a skimpy green jerkin. And he's <laughs> yeah. got his legs on show. Yeah, I yeah. don't know quite a few of the Panther paperbacks were like that. He always had plenty of leg on show. Often... Uh, what for the ladies. Yeah, yeah. Often a fancy dragon helmet. Yeah. Um, that, that was always a kind of a, a flaw of fancy novel covers in the 70s and 80s, though. Particularly with Conan, where he's just about naked probably wearing a fairy nappy yeah. and of course that carried on over into the Marvel comics but when you read a Conan book or a Conan story he wears clothes like normal people yeah, exactly. he's not running around just about naked and yeah running around a pair of pants to fight a, yeah. a horde of barbarians yeah. no, it's not interestingly though one of the earliest um, representations of Elric outside of all the James Carthorne stuff and some of the illustrations in his earlier books was Elric in the Savage Sword of Conan who was drawn by Barry Windsor Smith, and is wearing a ridiculous conical hat, thigh length, th- thigh height, kinky boots, oh, yeah. and um, and like a, a green suit with a long jacket. Uh, and, and at the time, Mocock was like, "What the, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is this?" And it turns out Barry Windsor Smith didn't have any reference whatsoever for Elric, so he found the Ace Sixties, um, and I mean Ace, the publisher, the Sixties yeah. Ace Pocket Book, where some guy just kind of did a quick painting for the cover wearing exactly the same thing and that's how he ended up looking in, in the Savage Star of Conan. Yeah. I think he might have been changed later on. I mean it's rubbish anyway so there's oh, no right, worry yeah. about that. No, never but, but that whole kind of representation of Elric with the exception of Barry Windsor Smith in, in the Savage Star of Conan generally is um, massive winged helmets yeah, spiky breastplates um, or green yeah. jerkin with his legs out. <laughs> or black leather. Kind of thing. Or black leather yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's, it's quite amusing, then, <laughs> when Elric does turn up. And uh, so he turns up and says, Ah, oh, such confidence, gentlemen, is warming to the heart. There was irony in the heavy voice which came from the entrance to the hall. The heads of the six sea lords jerked towards the doorway. Yaris's confidence fled from him as he met the eyes of Elric of Malnibone. There were old eyes and a fine-featured, youthful face. Crimson eyes which stared into eternity. Yaris shuddered, turned his back on Elric, preferring to look into the bright glares of the fire. So, you know, so far so good. Oh, sounds yeah. quite cool. Yeah. And uh, he greets Smjorgen, so, you know, demonstrating the friendship between the two, gives the others a nod, a cursory nod, and then the description goes thus. <laughs> Elric was tall, broad-shouldered and slim-hipped. He wore his long hair bunched and pinned at the nape of his neck and, for an obscure reason, affected the dress of a southern barbarian. He had long, knee-length boots of soft doe leather, a breastplate of strangely wrought silver, a jerkin of chequered blue and white linen, breeches of scarlet wool, and a cloak of rustling green velvet. Yeah. Mm. At his hip rested the rune sword of black iron, the feared Stormbringer, forged by ancient and alien sorcerer. His bizarre dress was tasteless and gaudy, <laughs> and did not match his sensitive face and long-fingered, almost delicate hands. Yet he flaunted it since it emphasised the fact that he was, did not belong in any company. 
that he was an outsider and outcast. So he's dressed like a Burke. Yeah, yeah, he's just going there, going, oh, check me out. <laughs> yeah. I've got the red pantaloon stroke checked jacket on. Yeah. He's probably had like a beanie on or something. Yeah, he's given Jick of the Dandy a real run yeah, for his yeah. money. I bet he's he's well jealous. Yeah. So he turns up, looks pretty much like a bit of a buffoon. But what there isn't in there is any description of um, details which I think as time went by started to creep in. Especially with things like the Eldren, which we'll come to in, in a later podcast, and the fact that Mel Nibonians have some kind of kinship with the Eldrin yeah. of like elfin like features yeah, yeah. almond shaped eyes etc etc but at this stage it's, it's just described as it's an a, albino block yeah dressed rather clumsily yeah dressed in the dressed dark like a yeah. tool yeah, yeah. frankly um, you know not that I can really claim any sartorial <laughs> well you know, elegance or we all we are both wearing smoking jackets obviously well this Velvet is true team. yeah if, if only we were smoking oh, better days so Elric greets his friend Smeagan, Um and the Sea Kings are so anxious about having such a massive fleet gathered, especially when Elric says he needs three days to sort out some business first at home. Yeah. They're all a bit perturbed by this. He's yeah. like, oh, I'm just going to nip home. Yeah, I'm just going to head back to the island, yeah. the one we're about to attack. That's right. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Talk amongst yourselves. The, mm. other, the other thing that I, I notice is, like, you know, six of the most powerful Sea Kings... Seems to be just like down the pub having a chat. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, you think they've probably got a bit of cash, judging by the boasting at the beginning. It's mm. like, why are they at somebody's palace or, you know, a decent hotel? Well, we, we, we found they're, they're essentially gathered around a fire next to a fjord. Yeah, I thought where, they were where in a all, pub. Where, no, no, I think, I think um, all 400 of the ships are nearby. Yeah, right. I think Yaris at one point says, um, well, Eric's not going to turn up, he's probably in pub laughing about yeah. his all being here. Anyway, oh, what we can agree on, there's a fire in the hall. Yeah, there is a fire. Yeah, I'm wrong. I was just in, I was in my head. They were just sort of sat around the pub having yeah, a bit too of a much chat. D and D. That's your yeah, problem. Yeah, that's how it all starts. So, Elric says he needs three days to sort some business out, and they're all, "Whoa, no, dog, you can't get there and back in three days." He's like, "Yeah, of course I can. Okay, Absolutely yeah. no problem." Um, so, and I'll have the fleet for you. So Smiagan says, "If you say so, but you know why." Why do you have to go for three days? So Elric says something along the lines of, I have my own compunctions. Well, actually, not something along the lines of, he says precisely, yeah, yeah. I have my own compunctions, Counts Miagan, but worry not, I shan't betray you. I'll lead the raid myself. Be sure of that. So Elric conjures a supernatural mist to hide the fleet. The six sea lords go to bed on a belly of wine, totally shit in the pants yeah. at the scale of Elric's power and uh, feeling a little bit unsettled by it all. So Elric has a kit leaves in the night so this is low fantasy isn't it? Is it the the way the magic is described it's quite interesting I think that Smeagan goes out and accompanies Elric when he casts the spell and basically coming in like he's, he's half dead and yeah. doesn't want anybody to talk to him and downs a gallon of wine to try and get the memory out of his brain yeah which, a... which I quite like so there's, there's no depiction of Elric's sorcery or no depiction of um you know, is using his verbal somatic and material components or anything like that. It's, no, it's, no, it's just they come in that you see the the kind of what what he's done as opposed to how he did it really, mm. and that's always been pretty much Mokok kind of and yeah. Elric spells and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and uh, I like that kind of saying. That's why I liked um, similar in, in the Conan books, to be honest. Sorcery is costly, dangerous, yeah, and difficult to implement. And if people have those kind of powers, usually. Um, there's a highly personal cost, and that's definitely yeah. What's yeah, going I think, on, and yeah. you know, with the Elric stuff as well. You know, later on, he's he's described as the greatest sorcerer in the world, and, mm. he, and he always seems a bit crap, really. Yeah, in the sorcery department, he yeah. does stuff, and he's like, oh, oh <laughs> yeah. I need to go to bed. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah. oh, get me some herbal tea. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. Interestingly, no mention of his herbal tea. In no, that. no. Um, so anyway, Elric as a kip drinks some wine, then sneaks off into the night and leaves them to it. So we cut to the beach where Elric's got his own boat. Legs astride. Mm -hmm. you know, not, <laughs> That's right. He, yeah, he's not just stood there, his legs astride. That's right. You know, and his uh, big genitals, please. Yeah, and in, in order to power his what, effectively magic speed boat, yeah. he, um, he summons <laughs> elementals, he summons the, summons the slifts of the breeze. Yeah, he does. The Sharnam's 
makers of girls. And I'll leave you to do the last and one. And the well. harsh hands. <laughs> <laughs> what was that again? The harsh hands. This is where the apostrophes start to come in thick and fast. Yeah. The harsh hands. <laughs> Builders of whirlwinds. And to be fair, it works a treat. He, yeah. he gets to a rear in good time. It's a bit Sp- like the man with two brains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. <laughs> harsh <laughs> um, And he sneaks onto the island at night. It's a deadly place for men. Elric digs it. Poisonous berries. Yeah. Rotten undergrowth. <laughs> it, fresh smells. He really enjoys the stench of the rotten undergrowth. <laughs> yeah. That's actually yeah. in, like, in the book. Oh, it's so good to be home. Oh, with brilliant. those wintry smells of rotten undergrowth yeah. and poison berries. Yeah, I've missed that. Yeah. Oh, he does miss it. He does, yeah. He, he loves it. So, at this stage, he's been declared an outdoor by his cousin Yakun and usurped from his throne, but his desire for revenge is pretty extreme. Um, and you, we learn that he wants him Maria utterly destroyed. Yeah, seems a bit harsh. Really. Yeah, it does seem a bit harsh at this he stage. He could just keep kill Yaku and get back his throne, which he's given up. Yeah. And uh, everybody, it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. So he reaches the city, and there's quite a nice description. Once again, I'm going to read from the text of, uh, of the Dreaming City. Uh, where are we? So at last he came to the city. It stood out in stark black silhouette, a city of fantastic magnificence in conception and in execution. It was the oldest city in the world, built by artists and conceived as a work of art rather than a functional dwelling place. But Elric knew that squalor lurked in many narrow streets, and the Lords of Maria left many of the towers empty and uninhabited rather than let the bastard population of the city dwell therein. There were few dragon masters left, fewer would claim Malnabonian blood. So it's really interesting. I thought that's the bit when I was reading it, I was thinking like that because sometimes Mocops kind of denigrated for his well building and hmm. for a lack of but I, I think he can sum up like a really interesting kind of culture or or place without having you know I think sometimes with fantasy it's almost overdone the world building yeah. you know oh, I've, I've planned like the history for the last 3,000 mm. years in graphic detail but mm. ultimately it just slows the story down sometimes and I think yeah I think for the description of the city was really cool because mm. I'd, I'd forgotten about that bit. Yeah, because well, it's not in it much, is it? It's in that and the the first book, the El, Elric of Melnibone, yeah. you call it, which it doesn't go into that much detail of the city. Mm. It just shows it as quite pretty, doesn't it? And mm. Well, the beauty of reading this, and and I, f- I think this is probably the first time I've read this. I don't know for twenty years. Yeah, so maybe mean. more. Yeah. Um, and I can't get out of my head the fact he was 22 when he wrote it. Mm. And his writing style is simple, mm. but so evocative yeah, and descriptive. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Because th- this continues. Built to follow the shape of the ground, the city had an organic appearance, with winding lanes spiralling to the crest of the hill where stood the castle, tall and proud and many spired, the final crowning masterpiece of the ancient forgotten artist who had built it. But there was no life sound emanating from Imria the Beautiful, only a sense of soporific desolation. The city slept, and the dragon masters and their ladies and their special slaves dreamed drug-induced dreams of grandeur and incredible horror, while the rest of the population, ordered by curfew, tossed on tardy mattresses and tried not to dream at all. That's yeah. just a fucking great description yeah, it's, of, it's... of what sounds like a truly dreamy, but kind of nightmarish, horrifying place. Yeah. It's yeah, it's, I agree. Yeah, I, it's, I was really impressed with all that because I'd forgotten about, as I said, the story for a start, but also I'd, in my head I always had it as, as if it wasn't that squalid. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, whenever I think back, and, and, and particularly, you know, I suppose when, when you. Role playing games are always going to pop up in this podcast because, of course, thinking back 29 years, I think we bonded over three things. Two of which were Michael Burcock and role playing games. Yeah, and um, time and time again, we'll, we'll do we'll do an episode on role playing games specifically. But they always mercilessly fail to capture what the essence yeah, yeah. of of the Young Kingdoms is, um, and this is a perfect example. There was a whole source book done on Melnibana, and it lacks the flavour of that one paragraph. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just, but it's, think, it's a real talent here. I think. Yeah. So, Elric sneaks through the city and meets his old servant Tanglebones. I think it's just sorry, just to yeah. just to go back. There's one bit on here where 
it's just this little bit which says often he would hear wild laughter echo echoing from one of the towers still ablaze with bright torchlight which flung strange disturbing shadows on the walls often too he would hear a chilling scream and a frenzied idiot's yell as some wretch of a slave died in obscene <laughs> agony to please his master so there's that bit about the Melibonians which yeah. are kind of they are pretty evil and yeah. then the next sentence is pretty much Elric was not appalled by the sounds and the dim lights. He appreciated them. <laughs> no, that was it. So somebody's being tortured in agony, you know, to please his master, and Elric's yeah. going, "Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that don't bother me at all. I, I feel at home." Yeah. Um, quite regularly, whilst reading this, I kept thinking, "Is Elric the villain?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a bit of a bastard. He is. Yeah. You know, but whether by by nature or by culture or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just it's just fantastic, evocative writing. So he he meets his old servant Tanglebones, who's still loyal, who's his uh, essentially his valet, I guess, from, yeah. from back in the day. We yeah, we've missed Tanglebones obviously yeah. until we go back to Elric of Malibone, mm. and he, he's back. He's yeah, back we, in we, we get more Tanglebones. Yeah, which yeah we've really missed. Yeah. So Tanglebones gets Elric to the tower where she still sleeps in bed. Yeah. Us. So she being Elric's uh, the the object of Elric's affection. Mm. And then we get a bit of textbook Moorcock action, um, where they get to the uh, the chambers yeah. where the object of his affection is, and there is uh, a guard outside, and Tanglebones has planted a bow just yeah. in, for this very occasion. Yeah. But because he's a useless old twat, he fires a shot. A cackhand and, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and misses. So at this point, Elric gets to leap into action. Um, and this is an awesome piece of action description, which is very typical of, of, of Moorcock action, but it, it, it does go slightly strange. So Elric acted swiftly, leaping forward, his rune sword drawn and its alien power surging through him. It howled in a searing arc of black steel and cut through the burned bow which the eunuch had hoped would deflect it. The guard was panting and his thick lips were wet as he drew breath to yell. As he opened his mouth, Elric saw what he expected had expected. The man was tongueless and was a mute. His own short sword came out and he just managed to parry Elric's next thrust. Sparks flew from the iron and Stormbring a bit into the eunuch's finely edged blade. He staggered and fell back before the nigromantic sword, yeah. which appeared to be endowed with a life of its own. Yeah, I've, I've got to confess, I got to that point and scratched my head a bit and thought, hang on. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> did say me. What? Yeah. Um, and he uses that twice, doesn't he? Yeah. In the, in the story, I, I can't remember that at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure what to make of that. No. Now, obviously, Stormbring is black. Yeah. And it's a play on the word necromantic. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, a bit weird. Bit of a strange one that one. Um, anyway, the, the the fight concludes. Uh, the eunuch only saw a glim, dim, a dim glimpse of his opponent behind the blade. The eunuch saw only a dim glimpse of his opponent behind the black whirling blade which appeared to be so light and which was twice the length of his own stabbing sword. He wondered frenziedly who his attacker could be and he thought he recognised the face. Then a scarlet eruption obscured his vision. He felt searing agony clutch at his face. And then, philosophically, for eunuchs are necessarily given to a certain <laughs> fatalism, realised that he was to die. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think might be a bit over the top for me just being <laughs> stabbed in yeah, the face. Really. It, it is slightly over the top. And then and then it's followed by Elric stood over the eunuch's bloated body and tugged his sword from the corpse's skull, wiping the mixture of blood and brains on his left <laughs> <on his blood. laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite an interesting yeah. mixture of language. <laughs> it's a bit of a, Yeah. It's like, oh, there's the poetic section, and now I'll just, yeah, just wipe my sword on his cloak. Yeah, needless to say, when I was 17, <coughs> I thought it was fucking ass. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it's, so uh, the fight concludes um, with uh, brains and jibs, and is, is quite unpleasant. But Elric enters the chamber of Cimarelli's cousin, who's been kept asleep by the sorcery of her brother, Yakun. And, naturally, Yakun and his goons show up, pounding on the door. And uh, Yakun and Elric exchange barbs for about oh, a page, yeah. I know. which is kind of brilliant. And I thought at this point we we could maybe we could maybe take a roll each and throw oh, yeah, at each yeah. other across the table. So who do you want to be? Uh, I'm not not bothered really. I'll... You be Yakun then, because yeah. I get the best one then. 
Yeah, fair enough. Where are we then? So, start from paragraph three on page 43. Whoever is in there. Whoever is in there, you will be destroyed a thousand times when you are caught. You cannot escape. If my sister is harmed in any way, then you will never die. I promise you that. But you will pray to your gods that you could. Yeah, coon, you paltry rabble. You cannot threaten one who is your equal in the dark arts. It is I, Elric, your rightful master. Return to your rabbit hole before I call down every evil power upon, above and under the earth to blast you. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> I was laughing hesitantly then. <laughs> just uh, just on that very point, yeah. on, in my version it yeah. says, Yeah, Kuhn, you paltry bombast. Really? <laughs> Interesting. So yours, I suspect, it's an is, old, it's a young, is, uh, is a cult- newer is a, version. Well, it's, it's a newer edition, but I suspect it's a compilation of Steel of Souls, the 60s collection, and Stormbringer, whereas this is the 1984... Oh, 1961, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, although it's a more recent edition in the sci-fi fantasy masterworks, it's actually a more, a more an older version of the text. So which one did you add? You had uh, you poultry... Yeah, you poultry rabble. Oh, uh, yeah. You poultry bombast. Yeah, yeah, you poultry bombast. Okay, so return to your rabbit yeah. hole before I call down every evil yeah. power upon, above and under the earth to blast you. So you've returned again to try and waken my sister, and any such attempt will only slay her. It will send her soul into the deepest hell, where you may join it willingly. By Anara's six breasts. <laughs> you, you it will be who samples the thousand deaths before long. And, you yeah, know, the next yeah, well, Enough of this, guards, break the door down. Yeah, yeah. But over the years, I've often thought, I'm 47 now, and I've often thought I'd like a tattoo. But I've never got a tattoo because I thought I could never think of something yeah. that I would, even on my deathbed, I would still appreciate <laughs> But across my back, having by Anara's six breasts, <laughs> you it will be who samples this thousand deaths before long, I think is probably the it's one. It's got to be up there, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good. And the question over his lips, who is Anara and why has she got six breasts? Who indeed knows? We yeah. may find out in subsequent books, we, but we probably, probably don't. We probably don't. I don't know. Undoubtedly, somebody will have put it in one of the role-playing game source yeah. books. And we'll find out. The Anara six breast source book. Yeah. 30 quid. <laughs> Bob Girondis. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, the door gets kicked in. Elric snatches a kiss with Cimmeril and then goes down to uh, is cutting this? off heads and shearing off faces. Is it mentioned who she is yet? Um, I, th- I think it's mentioned on the first page that um, he really is cheesed off with his cousin and yeah. his yeah his cousins. He loves his cousin's sister. Yeah, but you know, like for the sake of argument. So yeah, comes his cousin. She's his cousin. Is in love with his cousin. Don't worry, it gets worse in the <laughs> Michael Moorcock books. It really Cousin does. Love is about the lowest level of yeah, that, in- incest. Yeah, that's, that's probably just it, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, get this. I once recommended that my mum read An Alien Heat. Right. And um, it okay. may not instantly trigger your memory, but trust me, it's a really fucking bad idea. <laughs> so the dog gets kicked in. Elric starts cutting off heads and shearing off faces. He's outnumbered, though, so he begins shrieking a summons to his fickle patron god. And for the first time in these million books, we hear Blood and Souls for My Lord Ariok. Yeah, that could be another tattoo could on, be. The, on the other arm. Yeah, um, so this really saves his neck, and Ariok does the nasty in quite quite gruesome and pleasant fashion. He does, yeah. Yeah, and um, Ariok turns up numerous times over the course of the books, and actually turns up in, in other stories of other characters as well, doesn't like it? Like the Swords. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is probably the most disturbing... Um, depiction yeah, yeah. Of, of an avatar of Ariok. Suddenly the soldiers seemed to sense that there was something behind them. They turned, four of them, and each screamed insanely as the black horror made one final rush to engulf them. Ariok crouched over them, sucking out their souls. Then, slowly, their bones began to give a snap, and still shrieking beastily, the men flopped like obnoxious invertebrates upon the floor, their spines broken, but they still lived. Yeah, that's yeah, it's pleasant. pretty grim. Isn't it? it sounds like a shog off or something, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, I was thinking it's very uh, Lovecraftian. Hmm, it's quite nasty. Um, so it makes himself scarce, but not before giving Tanglebone some instructions for when he returns in five days. So, but back to that brief discussion we had earlier on. Is Elric a villain? Because he's always seen as an anti-hero, though, isn't he? Yeah. So. What, what do we even mean by anti-hero? A hero who does really fucking appalling things and behaves like a villain? Yeah, or you could describe him as a villain. 
I suppose if you, <laughs> you know, anti-hero, villain, whatever. So yeah. basically, this guy can summon a god of hell, who mm-hmm. he actually is his patron. Yeah. He basically sacks his entire city so he can uh, have a word with Yakun and then get his uh, cousin stroke lover mm. back in the game. I don't think he's thought it through, really, has he? He's like, oh, yeah, we'll sack the city. It'll be mm. ace. I'll get Sumeril and we'll go and live on an island or something. Is well, you never know. We've, we've not got that far yet. It might all turn up roses. It might do. It might, it might, all, it might play a blinder. It might all come <laughs> it off absolutely brilliantly. It usually does. Yeah, and every, everybody gets back to the pub <laughs> and has some pork scratchings and a couple of pints and laughs it all off. There we go. Oh, I remember that time yeah. uh, when we are in Emma, yeah? yeah? Brilliant. So, thanks to Ariok's intervention, Elric uh, gets back to... To the fleet, and we cut to Elric with the fleet. It's on its way. It's think, all on. Do you think his escape from that room was a bit, bit easy? Yeah, it was a bit. It's, 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 it's a bit. Um, Ariot was there, and, and basically Elric pushed past his cousin, yeah. spared the final glance for Simril, and then ran away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, brave, brave Sir Elric, bravely <laughs> ran away. Um, yeah, you know, fair play. Let's just cut to the chase. Yeah. We're, um, we're bored of this bit. Yeah, yeah, get, yeah, yeah. Let's get attacking. So Elric's back with the fleet. He's in a bad mood. Even Smeargon isn't going near him because he's, uh, you know, being very terse and just yeah. issuing orders. And there, there are some, again, there are some absolutely fantastic descriptions, and I, I, I won't read them out. But the description of the fleet and the the disposition of the fleet and the sailors going about their business in a couple of hundred words. As it bears down on the Dragon Isle, which is the first time we hear the word Dragon Isle. Yeah, it is. Mm, I wonder if that'll be important later on. I don't think it on. will. No, I don't think no, so either. Think just... we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll find out. And then we get to the point where we have the battle at the uh, at the gates to the maze. And we're briefly introduced to Divim Tarkan. Tarkan yeah. Who I didn't remember at all. No, I, I remember Divim Tavar and Divim Slorm. That was um, the other one. Yeah, and, and Majum Colin, the... Uh, Oh, yeah. The Admiral of the Fleet, I remember him too. But Divin Tarkin, I didn't remember at all. And he's only in it for like a page and a bit. But he's kind of the POV character there, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, and Which it's is... absolutely fantastic. Not only is he kind of quite nicely fleshed out for what is essentially a throwaway character, yeah. uh, but he gets an absolutely spectacularly brilliant death. Yeah. <laughs> well. Well, but the other thing, you know, you talk about the elvish kind of Maldabonian yeah. kind of thing. On here, he sounds a bit like David Niven, to be honest. It's like, <laughs> commander of the world was a sensitive man who loved life and its pleasures. <laughs> he was high-browed and handsome, with a thin wisp of beard and a tiny moustache. That, to me, is David that Niven with a beard. Pretty much is yeah. David Niven with a slight, with a tiny goatee. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it? Or maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah. He looked well in the bronze armour and high plaid plume down He did, yeah. So he's a healthy-looking guy. Yeah, yeah. He did not want to die. He didn't. Unlucky. Yeah, yeah, it's shame, Matt. Unlucky. Um, How did he go out? There's a, there's a cracking description of uh, of some archery and, and the attack of catapults on the walls and other bits and pieces. Uh, it's really, really cool, really fast-paced. Um, and then... I, th- I don't know. Should we spoil it for the listeners as to how brilliant his death is? Or should we just should we just get it out there? We could just say, you know, diving tack and still lived. The red blood stained his yellow tunic. And an arrow shaft protruded from his left shoulder. So he's, he's doing all right. Yeah, he's not yeah, doing bad. No, nothing, nothing to see here. Yeah, Tarkin. Yeah, he's uh, he's. Or shall we talk about his amusing? Uh, well, I think we should continue, shouldn't we? Yeah. Go, read on. He still lived when the first ramship moved intractably towards the great wooden gate and smashed against it, weakening it. The second ship sailed in and bes- beside it, and between them they stove the gate and glided through the entrance. Perhaps it was an outraged horror that tradition had been broken which caused poor Divin Tarkin to lose his footing at the end of the wall and fall screaming down to break his neck on the deck of Count Smeorgan's flagship as it sailed triumphantly <laughs> through the gates. That's, that's just brilliant. He's, he's so offended. By the break of tradition. By the break of tradition that he loses his footing and (laughs) falls screaming to his death. Breaking his neck on the... That's just wonderful. They didn't didn't even mention him though, did they? Do you think they just carried on with him? Because you probably noticed somebody just landed in front of you. Yeah. And I've I've, I've got to say, I'm, I'm... 
I'm deeply disappointed that he didn't get a stat block <laughs> in any of these source books because surely he's he is now officially one of my favourite characters. Yeah, that's mine as well. Yeah. Probably a Melanobonian legend. Yeah, and I, w- I will only ever envisage him now as David <laughs> Niven. <Never. laughs> yeah. Going out. I, I, that's the thing, isn't it? You're in the middle of a battle and you just trip over and <laughs> fall to your death. It's rather embarrassing. It's just fabulous. Oh, <laughs> tradition. Well, I can't remember any of that. When I first read no, it, no. I was like, oh, bro. No, I if you'd have asked me a week ago, how long is it since you read The Weird of the White Wolf, I'd have said, oh, I must have read it in the last ten years. But yeah. I honestly don't think No, I no, I couldn't remember it either. Yeah. So anyway, 1-0 to Elric yeah, at yeah. this point, I think. So Elric guides the fleet through the maze, and once 20 or so ships are in the harbour of Amaria, he cuts a bloody path through the defenders to reach his pre-arranged rendezvous with Tanglebones. But they up. Well, whilst the, uh, the invaders set to reaving and killing his people... Which he just obviously doesn't give two hoots about. He doesn't seem to give a toss, does no. he? Really? He's just, yeah, whatever. Yeah. So he arrives at the rendezvous with the Tower of D- Ar Putna. Yeah, get those hyphens. Which in. establishes the law of two apostrophes in yeah. every tower title. Yeah, I think you have to, do you? Um, however, Tangleburns is down. He did get Cimmeril into there, but his plan went shit shit yeah, when he got rumbled he's... and dealt with a mortal wound. He did. By a coon. Because blood dribbled down his wizened chin. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And um, this this is actually one of my favourite passages <laughs> in, in all of this. Tanglebone's old face twisted in pain and grief. She, I, I brought her here, master, as you ordered, but... <laughs> he coughed and blood dribbled down his wizened chin. But Prince Yakun, he, he apprehended me, must have followed us here. He struck me down and took Simril back with him. Said she'd be safe in the Tower of Baal O Nesbet. Master, I'm sorry. So you should be, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Old friend. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. <laughs> Take that, old geezer. <laughs> Up your stangle bones. You better write royal tit to <sighs> And he, he does see this. <laughs> then his turn softened. Do not worry, old friend. I'll avenge you and myself. I can it, still reach Cimmeril now I know where Yerkun has taken her. Thank you for trying, Tangleburns. May your long journey down the last river be uneventful. Which, he turned ab- abruptly on his heel and left the chamber. <laughs> <It'd be laughs> running down the stairs and out into the street. It's like, oh, it's all right, old dude. <laughs> I'll just I'll just fuck off while you bleed out. But blood but, but blood side. I will get vengeance for us both. But the fact oh. that he, the fact they mentioned vengeance for himself <laughs> as well, slightly egotistical. Yeah, uh, appreciate you dead old man. Absolutely. It'd be better if Tanglebones then shouted out the out the room. Actually it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I might survive. <laughs> Have you got any bandages? Oh, it's just perfection. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's absolute perfection. <laughs> so you should be <laughs> You stupid old <laughs> git. I'll give you one job. One job. Uh, so, Elric knows Yakun has taken Cyril to the Tower of Baal Nesbet. <laughs> Which just reminds me of Main- James Nesbet. Yeah, <laughs> the Tower of James Nesbet. Yeah. Um, you know, maintaining the two apostrophe rule for any <laughs> any towers in, uh, in, in in the Dreaming City. Yeah, it's, it's the rule. It also um, mentions that that's the site of his ancestors' dark sorceries and most frightful experiments. Oh, yeah, good good place. Yeah, so it's showdown time, and briefly skimming over the whole password magic jewel. Bit. Oh god, but, that know, was rubbish, wasn't yeah, it? That, that was a bit rubbish, especially when he, you know, he didn't want to go into a trance just in case somebody would sneak up on him yeah. to remember what the password was. Yeah, so it's, there's all that kind of bit, and then after it, then he cried, "I command the open." Yeah, so it's not much of a password. So just like so. FFS, just <laughs> <laughs> I've been studying here for hours. Yeah. <laughs> what was the password? Open. Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but it works. Yeah, it works. He gets in, and we, and we have the showdown between Elric and Yerkoon, and the throwdown. And Yerkoon's wielding Stormbringer's sister sword, Mornblade. Yeah, which I, I also didn't remember. I only thought Mornblade was introduced in in the prequel Elric of Melnivore. But there you go. So, yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, so so they have a big throwdown, and Yerkoon's sorcery ensures a preponderance of psychedelic lava. Yeah, which I, you got to have it. Well, it's the seventies. Yeah, the 60s, absolutely. Psychedelic lava. Um, so really, Stormbringer and Mornblade go at each other, dragging the wielders kind of like puppets. 
Yeah. Yeah, Coombs drooling, insane with hate and violence. Elric's a bit cross as well. Yeah, well, there's, there's a... I kind of dig this, because everything... The narrative's obviously from Elric's perspective. Um, and it's highly likely that to a bystander, Elric would really appear similarly deranged because yeah. th- there's even a passage where it says that his his hate overtakes any kind of reason yeah. and Stormbringer's just dragging him around and he's completely consumed by his hatred for Yakun. Which would be great in a film. And and then at a point Simmeril quite faithfully pleads with Elric to sheath Stormbringer. Um which turns out to be, you know, quite prophetic. Um as she says Put Stormbringer away, sheathe your sword, or we will part again. But even if he could have controlled the Whistling Blade, Elric would not have sheathed it. Hate dominated his being, and he would sheathe it in his cousin's evil heart before he put it aside. So they're both really kind of drooling, yeah. fire-consumed... But the other thing is, if he did sheathe it, wouldn't Yakin just stab him through the head? Well, there is that. So <laughs> it could go down as either prophetic or really bad advice yeah, exactly. from Cimmeril. Yeah, cheers um, Cimmeril. I'm dead now. Yeah. Um, well, finally, anyway, Elric pretty much almost cleaves Yakun in two, but not quite. And with the last of Mornblade's power, his cousin chucks Simmeril on Stormbringer's point. Yeah. And she dies screaming. Yeah. Bummer. Yes, there's not many laughs there, was there? Yeah. Now he puts Stormbringer down. Yeah. Falls to his knees and has a good sob. And, he does um, a lot of sobbing. He does, after between that. now and the end of the story, there's a lot of crying. It's pretty much non stop yeah. sobbing. So we cut back to Elric with the fleet sailing from Umaria Harbour, watching his city burn and crumble to rubble. It's then revealed by his thoughts that he actually put Yakun on the throne so he could go adventuring for a year. Yeah. Despite Simmeril pleading for him not to do it. So all this happened because he wanted a gap year. Yeah, yeah. So he, he thought, I don't want to be emperor. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll just go on holiday for a year. Yeah. Yeah, find myself. Yep. Yeah. And then come back with loads of annoying stories yeah. about how he's living it real. Yeah. And that's that's basically what the prequel Elric of Melnibona is about. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. It's him going on his gap here. Yeah. And kind of finding out that Yakun's a bit of a tit. Yeah. Who can't be trusted. Yeah. So it turns out he's on Yaris's ship as the youngster had got himself wildly drunk and died by the knife of a Melnibone and slave wench. <laughs> Yeah. So these these youngsters, you just can't trust them to sack a city <laughs> and, and come out the other side intact. Yes, those slave wenches are yeah. uh, scary stuff. So as they're pulling away, thirty Melnibonian battle barges emerge from the from the uh, the maze and start chewing up the fleet. Yeah. So Elric, thinking, oh bugger, <laughs> summons winds and a group of Reaver ships, including Smiagans, which is alongside his, start to escape the slaughter of the fleet. And once again, a little bit of text here, which I think is really, really cool. Quite suddenly, they were beyond the slowly cross- closing circle of Melnibone and ships and careering madly across the open sea, while all the crews sensed a difference in the air and caught glimpses of strange, soft-shaped forms around them. There was a discomforting sense of evil about the beings which aided them, an awesome alienness. Smiagan waved to Elric and grinned, th- grilled, <laughs> grinned thankfully. We're safe, thanks to you, Elric, he yelled across the water. I knew you'd bring us luck. Elric ignored him. For good reason, really, because he knows what's coming next. So the Miriam battle barges uh, start launching mighty grappling hooks onto the decks of the rearmost escaping ships and catapults start sending fire over and more and more of the fleet starts to get whittled down. A scant few, Elric's and Smeorgans, manage to pull away. But then, of course, we find out why the Dragon Isle is actually called the Dragon Isle. Yeah. And it twelve wasn't just dragon a riders. Name. <laughs> yeah. Twelve dragon riders um, arrive with. Uh, how is it, how is it, how is it described? They have. Uh, Imrearian warriors rode the dragon backs, armed with long spear like goads, they blew strangely shaped horns which sang out curious notes over the turbulent sea and calm blue sky. Nearing the Golden Fleet, now half a league away, the leading dragon sailed down and circled towards the huge golden flag galley, its wings beating, making a sound like the crack of lightning as they beat through the air. Now, I was thinking about this. 1961. So, now, in 2019, the idea of dragon riders and yeah, yeah. Kind of that fancy idea of people riding dragons, well, it's not that. It's, no, it's, it's it almost a little bit passe, isn't it? Yeah, Game of Thrones, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's probably... But D&D, riding, artwork. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, 1961, that's... 
I don't know if it's the first instance of... I mean, you, there's all sorts of things in the Dragon Riders of Pern. When were they written? No idea. No, I don't either. Yeah, but it's, it's... Never read them. It's, it's a pretty cool image. And, and actually, I thought about it again. I thought, the Targaryens are really, really elric Yeah, yeah. They are, yeah. So, George Martin's a massive fantasy nerd himself anyway. And a well, massive... he, never, he always talks about Tolkien, doesn't he? As yeah. opposed to... But he's also a massive role-playing nerd. May well have yeah. played Stormbringer or something like that. Bound to it. I reckon, reckon somewhere... <laughs> yeah, he did GM. Did yeah. <laughs> um, I reckon that somewhere in his subconscious, at the very least, um, he's got Elric and Dragon Riders, and this scene in particular... Yeah. In in his subconscious, when you start to read about, when he starts to write things about Targaryens, riding dragons, platinum hair, yeah, yeah. etc. Yeah. etc. I think you're right. I, I think it's a really really good example of how, whilst these days, if you go in Waterstones, you won't find any Mocock on the shelf, which is surprising, really, because yeah. how prolific he is. But his influence is shot through. No, I think so. Yeah, everything. I mean, yeah, yeah. I pretty much. Yeah. I mean, if you think about just the multiverse, yeah, chaos gods, yeah, gods of law, all yeah, that all side, chaos stuff. That's yeah. in, in pretty much every role playing game ever. Yeah, and you know, the, I think he has. I mean, culturally, he changed fantasy. I mean, after after reading Morcock, when I read some of the epic fantasy stuff, you know, that's about ten thousand pages long, and, mm. and it's just about some kind of tedious nonsense mm. it's really good to go back and and I said as I said before about the world building he kind of has built it's a pretty good picture of Melanie Bone mm. in, in that really you know 40 pages mm. as for a short story mm. you read it and go right okay they're pretty much evil yeah. they all are doped out the heads torturing slaves for a laugh yeah. uh, the emperor's a knobhead <laughs> yeah. they've got dragons Yeah, it's and that dragon thing, they describe them as like snake like, really, yeah. in the thing. But that, that image of you've got golden battle barges, which I think they're describing a later book and, and the sheer size of them. They're yeah, massive, they're multi they're, 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 they? Yeah, they're, they're absolutely vast. Yeah, and they're like burnished gold, yeah. which is a pretty cool image. Then yeah. you've got dragon riders coming over, and then you've got this albino in, in this crappy ship trying yeah. to escape. It's just, it's really cool, yeah. really good image. It's great imagery, isn't it? Yeah. And that's what he's always been good at, just the, the little like vignettes and the images that really stick in your head. Mm. They're just like it's completely you know, really visual. That's mm. why he'd make a really good film. Mm. And that's what I absolutely love about his is kind of his golden edge, if you like. Um Yeah. You know, you, you I suppose if we were to do the comic kind of thing and split it between his golden edge, his silver edge and his bronze edge, his golden edge probably ends after Probably maybe early seventies because I'd, I'd have a real tough time saying that the quest for Tanalon is in his golden age. No, <laughs> this, I, this might make sense on a later podcast, um, and yeah. we probably shouldn't go there right now. But his, his early stuff, um, having just recently started <coughs> a, a duel in the skull with my friend Natasha, and doing a similar thing, reading through forty pages, and reading it carefully because I'm going to talk about it. Um, it's fucking fantastic stuff. And it's for the space of forty pages. It really is amazing what is is, is able to conjure up. And yeah, I, do, yeah, I do remember yeah. reading Stormbringer at the time and thinking, you know, when I was seventeen, eighteen, and thinking, how can this be so evocative and rich when it's all described over the space of two pages? Yeah, yeah. it's it's really incredible. But anywho, um, Dragonfire hits the remost of the surviving ships. Elric at this point calls off the witch wind, which has been powering the remains of the yeah. kind of pathetic remains of the fleet, and just pours all of his power into the sails of his own and leaves all his comrades to burn, Count Smeogonin included. Yep. See you later, buddy. And then he does some more sobbing. Yeah. Yeah. Weeping as he sees Smeogonin's bald head. Yep. Unlucky Smeogonin. Crisp in the, uh, the dragon. The, the other thing about the dragons you know about, they don't breathe fire, do they? They. They've got flammable venom. Yeah, it's like napalm yeah. almost. Yeah. The way it's des- described is kind of like napalm. Yeah, yeah, which is quite interesting. Mm. Um, so a night later on the island of Pantang, which will take on oh, yeah. additional significance. I was quite surprised at that as well. Yeah, as the books go on. 
And also give the name to a new wave of British heavy metal, Nawabam band from the yeah, early 80s. Yeah, not necessarily yeah. a good thing. But yeah, no, Tigers right. of Pantown. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Tigers with a Y. It was Tigers with a Y. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he does some more sobbing. Yeah, quite a bit of sobbing. <laughs> he tries to throw Stormbringer away, but Stormbringer stands up in the water as if embedded in wood and howls at him. Yeah. So he goes, oh, the... sobs some more, dives in after it. Well, he has a moral di- dilemma, doesn't he? It's a bit like The Last Temptation of Christ, yeah. but not quite as uh, metaphysical. But, yeah. <laughs> but re- really kind of m- much more... In- Local. <laughs> so he's this there. spoke to me more, personally. Yeah, same here. So, so he's either going, uh, right, okay, I can either leave the sword and go and live on an island somewhere, maybe have a pop-up mm. restaurant or something, do mm. Melnibonian food. Yeah. Because there's going to be yeah, people who are going to need that. Yeah. Or I can get this sword and kick everybody's ass and yeah. be really evil. Yeah. And that was pretty much his And uh, after sobbing and being impressed by it standing up in the water. Yeah, yeah. I think that and, was and howling at him. Uh, yeah. He tries to reach it. Can't reach it because he's so pathetic. <laughs> yeah, because he's an absolute weed. Because he's such a pathetic weed. So he dives in after it. And, uh, and kind of accepts that his destiny is forged to the sword. By hell forged chains and faint, fate haunted, haunted circumstance, because <laughs> you do murmur to yourself. That's like right, that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well then, let it be thus, sir, and men will have cause to tremble and flee when they hear the names of El- Elric, Eric, <laughs> El- not Eric. <laughs> er- Eric's nothing to do with it. That was his twin brother, <laughs> Eric of Marylebone. Yeah. He's in a Jerry Cornelius book. Yeah. Um, Elric of Melnibone and Stormbringer is sword. We are two of a kind, produced by an age which has deserted us. Let us give this age cause to hate us. You know what? He's not showing a great deal of insight or self-awareness there, is he? He's not really, is he? He's kind of, you know, he's, he's balls, balls up massively there, isn't he, all yeah. round. And then at the end he's going, oh, I'll show him. Yeah. I'll show him that I'm a bit of a knobhead with yeah. a magic sword. And then, again, just brilliant. Strong again, Elric sheathed Stormbringer and the sword settled against his side. Then, with powerful strokes, he began to swim toward the island while the men he left on the ship breathed with relief and speculated while he would live or perish in the bleak waters of that strange and nameless sea. So he just jumps in the sea and swims off. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> far, <laughs> as far as the guys on the ship are concerned, yeah. he has a good sob, yeah. throws his sword overboard, then leaps after it and just yeah. fucking swims off. And which, leaps which, yeah, if, it. if you're going to kind of rewrite it, have it from one of the... It's been interesting to see what the guys on the ship were thinking about yeah. him. Oh, look at that knobhead. Yeah. You know, yeah, he saved us. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, me, my uncle's dead. Yeah. Well, as as these go on, of course, we we do get um. There's there's a couple of crossover events in there, and one has got a crossover with Erica's Heart Moon and Corum. Oh yeah. yeah. Which is in, which is described in the Sailor on the Seas affair from Elric's perspective in terms of the narrative. Yeah. But I think it's in the Champion of Garathorn, the Heart Moon novel. From yeah. Hartmoon's perspective, and the current one is and, the current one. Yeah, it? and 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 Elric is just a mardy twat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you do get you do get kind of a, a, di- a different, and they're all trying to outdo each other with what something looks like yeah. when they go to that weird place. And yeah. It's like Hartmoon goes, "Oh, it looks looks like a machine," and Corum's going, "Well, it looks more like a musical instrument." Elric's going. It looks like a magic box. Uh, Elric just bit, breaks <laughs> yeah. down crying. Yeah, it's, he just weeps into, <laughs> into his hair. Elric accidentally kills it and <laughs> breaks down crying. Uh, Which is a bit of a theme, isn't it? It is a bit, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, he'll have a couple of other birds as time goes on. He'll have a few other mates. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Not so much. You don't want to be his don't, mate. Don't do not really go that well for him. No. So, so that was it. That was... The Dreaming City. Yeah, I, I liked it. Yeah. Hey, it's thumbs up from me. Yeah. Some of the dialogue's a bit crunchy, but... Yeah. You know, it's... I, I, think, I think the dialogue at the beginning, when it's just all the sea lords around the camp, is, is really good. Yeah, yeah. But once it comes to Elric basically talking to himself Not about so his fate yeah. and his destiny, <laughs> oh. oh, the irony, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, le- less good, but still thoroughly amusing. And probably the Bayanara Six Breasts line might be my favourite one all the, uh, in all of fantasy what was the other one the s- s- poultry bombast poultry bombast yeah. yeah yeah it's the name of my new album mm. <laughs> yeah but I think he, yeah we talk about some of his later kind of recyclings of Elric and the writing is better and the dialogue's better but mm. I think it's 
they're so slow compared to these you know he can fit in as you said you know with loads of well well building and a yeah. brilliant story in 40 pages yep. whereas the new ones you have to read like 300 pages for him to like you know put on a hat or something yeah they're, and they're I've not got as to say, pacey this is this is definitely my favourite mode of fantasy anyway I'm, I'm a big fan of Robert E. Howard because he, he can still do things in, in a fairly brief space of time and I'll take I'll take these any day over I don't know Poderdo Street Station which I think I got a third of the way through and just got fed up with nothing happening you know? There's, yeah. the powers of description are, are really good and really evocative but if you need if you need 50 pages to describe something that Mopat can do in two yeah, you've I, lost that, me I know what you mean yeah, yeah. I right, mean, dude. Well, that was an absolute pleasure talking mm. about the Dreaming City. Um, the roof garden is about to close, so we'd better tear out and probably go to the gin shop. I think we probably should. Yeah, and some. we'll uh, we'll catch up again somewhere further down the Moonbeam Roads and talk about yeah. something else. And have a glass of Acroids Vortex water. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> And thus ends episode one of Breakfast in the Ruins podcast. Many thanks to Loz for contributing and giving his thoughts. I enjoyed that very much. And uh, I'll look forward to getting out episode two, where Natasha and I will talk about the first part of The Jewel in the Skull. It's um, been an interesting journey, this. I don't really understand audio-visual equipment and recording functions, so it's been a, a really, really interesting experience figuring this out just as, as a hobby. And I hope you bear with me as we continue, um, and hopefully things like production values and everything else will improve as we go along. But for the meantime, thanks ever so much for listening, and I'll see you on the Moonbeam Roads.